Hi, my name is Lisa Elvin Stoltari, and this is my channel, Have Roots, Will Travel. I am a genealogist and a passionate traveler. Now, travel can take many forms. Sometimes it's virtual, sometimes it's actual, and sometimes we're doing a little bit of what I call time travel. And we're going to be exploring in this particular series um, a subject near and dear to my heart. The story of the Fijoa, the king's daughters. We'll be exploring in detail each of these Fijoa and where they where they came from, where they settled, and the families they produced. Let's start, shall we? The Fijoa was a program started by intended the Intendant Jean Tano in 1663. I go into detail um, about this program, the recruitment, how they were selected, what they brought aboard, the rewards they got, all of that good stuff. In a video that I've done called the Feed Your Water Program 2.0, please have a look at that if you care to know more about you know, your ancestor's journey um, from, Fra from France to New France, in other words, and how this particular program works. Now, let's talk about Anne Vidou. Now, she is my nine times great-grandmother, but here's where the story takes a little bit of a turn. Remember, I've talked about Le Vidoua, and now Anne did not arrive she did not arrive in New France um, during the time period, and we're going to get to that. But first, let's talk about where she was born. She was born in, in 1641 in saint sorne charente maritime in France. Her father was Jacques Vidou, and her mother was Marie Chauvelette. And you can see that I've circled where she is. She's on a coastal town. Um, now, the church was named saint Saint Saturne and dates back to the 11th century, with which, of course, many modifications along the way. And one of the reasons we know her parents' name is because of her first marriage. Now, the voyage to New France would not have been with the Mifijoa, but she technically, technically, um, contracted a marriage in 1663. So she somehow got herself across the sea, okay, on a vessel of some kind, and came to New France probably as, an, as a servant or something like that. And what we do know is that she had Jacques Loiseau, was November 3rd, 1663. So that puts her in in the thing, had she married like January of 1663, she wouldn't even be, we wouldn't even be talking about her. But because she contracted a marriage by, um, in November 3rd, 1663, it just worked out that way. So we will consider her a Fijoa as a technicality. But she's not a Fia Marie, which we've not talked about yet, but she, so she's kind of, She's definitely a woman who came across and married a man. So let's talk about the man she married. She married a man named Jean Junot on February 26, 1664. Let's talk a little bit about Jean. Now, Jean Junot was born about 1599 in the parish of Notre Dame de Cogne. The above picture of the church, which still stands, was founded in 1077. Think about that. 1077. We're talking William the Conqueror time. Just amazing to me. And was completely rebuilt in 1653. The parish was found found it in the historic province of Alnes, of which the capital is La Rochelle. Jean married Marie uh, Billion in France in 1628 and had three children. He was, we believe, widowed and came to New France with one or two of his sons. The first son, Pierre, we know died in 1660, 1655, killed by the Iroquois. He left behind a son, Jean-Pierre, who started the first um, who started the first family line in Quebec, um, and the presumed second son is Jean, and married Anne Rousseau, who was a Fijoa. But we will go into that a little bit more in detail. 
So now I want to make sure I draw to your attention the enormous age difference between, which we've never seen, okay? Jean was 65 years old and Anne was 23. A 42-year gap, which would make her, what would make her marry Jean? Was it love? Had she come to New France and not been successful in her marriage attempts? Remember that she was not protected by the Fijoa system, but yet is considered a Fijoa. I suspect Jean was the answer to many challenges she had. Let's review a little bit about Quebec City. It's the capital of the province of Quebec. Half a million people live here directly in Quebec City. Quebec was originally named by the Algonquins who named the area Quebec, K-E-B-E-C, which is in their native tongue, means where the rivers narrows. Quebec City lies where the St. Lawrence River narrows. Samuel Champlain founded a French settlement here in 1608 and called it Ville de Quebec or Quebec City. The city walls which surround it uh, date back to that time period, making Quebec City the only city with remaining city walls left in North America. There's so much to see in Quebec City, but I've chosen five buildings that were there when Jean, Jean and Anne lived in Quebec City. I like to imagine that I'm seeing what they saw. So let's start with Maison Jacquet. The house is the oldest surviving private residence in Quebec. It dates from 1675. And if you'd like to see it, it's home to a French, a very famous restaurant appropriately called Aux Anciens Canadiens, roughly translated to our old Canadians or to our historic Canadians. Uh, in the bottom left picture is the Auberge Place d'Armes, which dates from 1620 and was built for one of the pioneers of New France, Guillaume Criard. A wonderful restaurant called Bistro Size Cahau is found on the first floor. I just realized I said Size Cahau. 1640. Sometimes I, I go into French without even thinking about it. The Auberge de Trésor Hotel occupies the upper two floors. Next, we're going to look at Petit Champlain, which is thought to be the oldest, which is actually the oldest commercial district in North America. So it's very much cobblestone streets. It's part of what really, when people say how beautiful Quebec City is, that's what they're talking about. Then the Escalier Cascou means breakneck uh, stairs, and it was originally built um, as the stairs um, to Samuel Champlain's house um, and eventually 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 uh, they rebuilt it in the 1800s and it was then made they were originally uh, wooden stairs and they then they original then they did it um, in iron and then finally in this in the 1960s it was redone again and that's actually when English tour guides uh, called it a breakneck um, and then the French translated of course um, but nobody has ever broken their neck so just note to self and then the, the last one is uh, in the middle um, is Ursuline the Ursuline monastery and the Ursuline monastery is among well it was actually the oldest um, it was founded, it was the oldest monastery in North America, and it was founded in 1639 uh, by a missionary group of Ursuline nuns under the leadership of Mother Marie of the Incarnation. It's the oldest institution of learning for women in North America. And today the monastery serves as a museum, and it also serves as a learning, um, you know, as a learning place for um, for uh, people, uh, you know, a place where people can congregate, um, and it continues to serve as a teaching uh, center. Jean and Anne will produce three children. Marie Hélène is born in 1665 and goes on to marry Jean-Baptiste Montmagnier, dit Chez Germain, and has 11 children, at least five of whom reach adulthood. Anne 
um, actually did not marry, but she did, she did have what is now known as natural children um, with Marte Remy. Uh, so she had two children, uh, but did not get married. I love that story. I wish I knew more. And then we have Marie Suzanne, who was born in 1671 and marries Toussaint Fracard Dillet and has seven children, but only two of whom reach adulthood. Now, Jean Junot passes away in 1672 and Anne is left with three young daughters. By 1676, at the age of 35, she marries Etienne Jean Blanchon dit La Rose, who is also older than her, but this time only nine years older. Let's get to know Etienne a little bit better. Before we do that, let's make sure we know that his profession is that of a master tailor. And I just, I love that. I love that he was making men's suits. Where did Etienne come from? He came from the Rion, which was uh, the capital of the province of Auvergne until the French Revolution. Now, this is the church where he was baptized in, that we believe. Um, and he arrived in Canada um, in 1665 with the Carignan Regiment, so he was a soldier. He then married Anne Couvent, a widow, who was 30 years his senior in 1666. Don't you find this interesting? There's Anne marrying a man 42 years older, and there's Etienne marrying a woman 30 years older than him. I just find it fascinating. They did not have, for obvious reasons, any children. She died on December 25th, 1675, and he and Anne were married in June of 1676. So whether they knew each other, met each other, I'm not sure. But it's almost like, oh, thank God, they finally found each other. Now, so now they have um, some children. Charles, he passes away. They have five children. They pass away at, Charles passes away at four years of age. Francois, again, once, he, two years. Elizabeth is the first one, and she is um, their third child. She marries Augustin, Junot, did not to live, and they have 15 children, 14 of whom made it to adulthood. If you recall, in episode 18, we spotlighted the visual Anne Rousseau, who married Pierre Junot, who we think is the son of Jean Junot, who was the first husband of our current Fijoua and Vido. If that your head is spinning, I'm just telling you, this is, it was a, a remarkable for me to put the pieces together too. Had I done that before? No. Until I really, really delved into it, they were just names. And that's what makes this series so amazing for me to understand these were real living people with all kinds of issues. So I, I just love this. So Marie-Louise, uh, she marries a man named Jacques Tribault dit l'Africaine in a late marriage. She does not have any children. I was intrigued by the, by his dit name, dit l'Africaine. I thought, oh, maybe he was an African, an African American or African Canadian. He wasn't. He came on a ship called the African, and that is why he's also known as the African. Go figure. And then we have Anne Marie who marries Thomas Bercy, but as far as I can tell, did not have any children. So essentially, the same thing that happened in Augustine's case, in episode 18, he was the only survivor, and but he had all these children. Elizabeth is the only survivor, and she has all these children So, with him. So um, it is truly a remarkable story. Now, according to P Peter Gagné's excellent book, Les Filles du Roi, he states that Etienne returns to France in 1682 and essentially is essentially never heard from again. Blew my mind when I read this. The only, because in the ancestry it says he died and there's a find a grave, you know, that says there's a cemetery there. That's not what I'm reading. Um, and the only evidence we have is that Anne is mentioned on the document 
of April 26, 1703, in the marriage of her daughter, Marianne. Um, but therefore, we can assume that Marianne passes away sometime after that. As for Etienne, we cannot know if he was truly passed on, because that's what they said, um, or that was their way of covering up that he had abandoned the family. So, you know, someone has done a Again, that is one of the reasons why I'm doing this series, just to uncover all of the myths and truths and whatever's on different websites, Ancestor being one of them, my heritage, all of that. Um, because people tend to populate what's already gone before, thinking it's the truth. Well, we don't know it's the truth. I don't have a death certificate um, or death record. So we know they died. We just don't know the story unless we have a document. Um, and so, so ends this particular mystery. I feel like we've, we've, we've opened up a Pandora's box and we've actually, you know, opened up a box full of questions more than answers. But that's sometimes how genealogy works. And with that, we have completed episode 19. I look forward to seeing you with episode 20 with a brand new um, mini biography of another Fijoa. And with that, I will say goodbye for now, or as the French say, au revoir.